Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is August 2nd, 2013, and my guest is Barry Weingast. Barry is the Ward C. Krebs Family Professor in the Department of Political Science at Stanford University and a senior fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. He's written extensively on the political economy of development, legal institutions, and the rule of law and democracy. Among other books, he is the author, along with Douglas North and John Joseph Wallace, of Violence and Social Orders, a Conceptual Framework for Interpreting Recorded Human History, which was the subject of an Econ Talk episode back in 2007. Barry, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thanks. We're going to talk again about violence uh, and growth and political economies we did before. And, and you've written a paper with Gary Cox and Doug North called The Violence Trap and another paper uh, on Adam Smith. And we're going to use those to get us started. We'll start with The Violence Trap and then I hope we'll get to Adam Smith. Now you start with a very old and interesting puzzle. We have a good idea of the policies and institutions that lead to prosperity. Why don't the leaders of poor nations adopt those policies and try to create those institutions? So let's start by looking at what policies and institutions do we think are the keys to prosperity? Well, I think a lot economists have long understood this, and that is it involves the deepening of markets, uh, rule of law, open access, and competition. And so the puzzle is, if this is reasonably well understood, that countries that adopt these policies uh, do well, then the puzzle is, why don't they do that? Now, By a, open access, you mean, that's a term you use in your book and mm-hmm. that we talked about before. What do you, tell, tell us what you mean by open access. By open access, we mean that, that, that a large number of citizens have rights as opposed to a more narrow elite. And second, that citizens have the ability to form organizations, in particular, to compete with existing organizations organizations. And without the, their ability to form organizations, then competition is limited, and often uh, we see the creation of rents and rent-seeking. Exploitation, extraction of yeah, all these. Predation, things. yeah. So um, why, what are some of the arguments that, that academics and scholars have put forward to explain why this seemingly free lunch isn't eaten? You have all this... They have this opportunity to make the pie a lot bigger, and yet yes. you leaders often persist in following uh, unproductive, inefficient, impoverishing uh, policies. Well, the literature provides several different ideas about this. Uh, and let me mention three. So one is uh, Besley and Pearson, uh, who've written that you know politicians have a shorter time horizon because they only stay in office for so long. And so as a consequence, they are much less likely to impose policies that, that have benefits in the long-term future because that won't do them any good, especially if they have long, short-term costs. Another set of arguments uh, uh, goes back to Doug. Can I just stop you on that for a sec? So if you're a dictator, mm-hmm. uh, it still could be the case that the reforms might take longer than your lifespan to, mm-hmm. to, to come into play. Mm-hmm. So it's not just that you're in the mm-hmm. Congress for two years, or right? Mm-hmm. Okay, go ahead. And with dictators, there's the problem of coups. Yes, and there so is. That, re- that reduces their time horizon. We'll talk about violence uh, in a minute, and and some of the, and I'll give you some statistics about uh, turnover in uh, especially in poor countries that relates to uh, dictators. So go ahead. So that's one argument: is that short time horizon for yeah. the decision makers? Yes, and then we come to an argument advanced. Uh, by Doug North in his 1981 book, uh, Structure and Change, and Asimov and Robinson in a 2006 paper. And that is that many of these changes reduce the probability that the incumbents will stay uh, in office, in part because uh, reform um, creates powerful alternative actors who want control of the state and want to kick out the current people. And so as a consequence, this is a barrier to reform. Sort of a risk aversion uh, argument. It's a, it's a risk aversion <laughs> and... A future. <laughs> Bird in the hand is worth seven in the bush, uh, yes. right? So you, mm-hmm. it's true you could be richer, but you might not be empowered to, to be able to mm-hmm. to grab some of it. That's right. Okay. Any other 
But for sure you want to mention? Well, I wanted to mention the Roderick and uh, Fernandez, or Fernandez and Rod Roderick paper. So one of the things they observe is often the beneficiaries of a reform don't know who they are. So if you create competitive markets uh, that will produce uh, a whole bunch of wealth for a large number of people, those people tend to not know who they are uh, prior to reform. And as a consequence, there's less pressure for uh, reform while the current incumbents uh, who, who, advantage, who are advantaged by the existing scheme um, are there to uh, lobby against. And so the politics weighs against in, in their argument. And I think these are three different interesting arguments, all of which point to political mechanisms against reform. But you have a different explanation. So what are you proposing? Well, um, in our view, and this gets to the paper that uh, 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 Gary Cox, Doug North, and I have recently written, um, the problem is really the violence trap. And, and I want to begin by pointing out that I think economists have missed the, mar mar uh, the, the margin of violence uh, in the developing world. And as a consequence, they miss how um, developing countries organize themselves in a way that, that at once reduce the probability of violence, but also uh, create problems for economic growth. And there's a tendency, uh, as, as in Collier's book on the, the, the bottom billion, for example, to think about violence as something that happens in failed states. So there's a small number of states like Rwanda or Yugoslavia or Somalia uh, that go through these periods of violence, but, but, but they're isolated. Whereas our view, this is much more systematic. So shall I give you some data? Yeah, yeah, let's hear. So, so by the way, when you, when you talk about violence and economic development, I always think of an example that I, you know, I learned from Walter Williams. That most of human history, the way you got richer was to bang your neighbor over the head and take his stuff. Right. And you know, the insecurity of property rights mm -hmm. is obviously a deterrent to innovation, accumulation, Absolutely. et cetera. You're talking about a different level of violence. You're talking about national violence at the national level, civil war, revolution, right? Well, I think that they are related. But yes, I am talking about civil war, revolution, and I will mention coups. Yeah. Especially coups, because coups are a very important form of violence, very prevalent relative to the others uh, as far as uh, leadership turnover goes. Um, and so all those... Uh, uh, but, all those are very important, and when new leaders come in, they tend to have new factions, and they tend to expropriate or predate on the property of the existing people. So that means that investments ex ante are insecure in just the way you said. And so the violence trap does imply that insecure property rights enhance problems with investment. In particular, um, a lot of people are, will forego otherwise profitable investments because they're concerned that if there's violence, that those investments are worth nothing. And so... So it's not, it's not just the mob in the street or the caveman next door taking your uh, uh, saber-toothed tiger skin rug. It's also the new guy in office has a different set of... You might have been on the good side of the current leader, so your house is secure, but the new guy likes your villa and his friends come take it. Yes, okay. your villa and your business. <laughs> yeah, more than you got, yeah, right. Uh, uh, or your land uh, in, in a previous era when land was so much uh, the major asset. So let me give you some data on this. Um, if we're concerned here about violent leadership turnover, so we're going to discuss a regime. A regime is a country, and we're going to find a, a, a regime in a country as uh, a lasting as long as there's peaceful turnover in leadership. So that means if there's a coup, a regime ends. It also means that this is a very narrow definition of regime change because if we allow for a, a constitutional change uh, as regime change, that's not included here. So we're only looking at leader, violent leadership turnover. So in this world, the U.S. has one regime since 1789. Correct. Because we've never had a violence, as far as I know. That's right. Uh, we've so never we've had, had violence. violence, a civil war, but the civil war did not resen uh, result in the takeover of the government. The South failed. Okay. So as a consequence, we've had one regime, and we're, of course, the, the U.S. is, of course, the longest-lasting regime. It's the order statistic. Is it? I didn't, real, I didn't know that. Yes. Is that true? I think so. So um, if we look at the uh, prevalence of violence uh, in terms of regime change, uh, violent leadership turnover, what we see, if we look at the poorest half of the distribution since World War II, the median country has violence. Uh, the median poor country has and poor defined as uh, the bottom half of the distribution right, okay. of, of countries. And so, if, 
Uh, the the median, median within that half. The median within yes. that half experiences violence every seven years. A regime change. Yes. Violence of the level, not just some fighting outside the palace. Correct. That's but shocking. Presumably there's some of that, too. How yes. many countries are we talking about here, roughly? Uh, well, in the data set... Well, I guess it changes yeah. over time, but it's, it, yeah. it's a lot of countries. It's a lot of countries, yes. It's yeah. Which I means think. that you take that number, divide it in half, that means at least half of that roughly half, not at least half, half of that have had violence every seven years or more frequently. That's right. Which is very frequent. Yeah, a good 10%, I think, last only one year uh-huh. of poor countries. That is, poor countries in the second half, the, the bottom half of the distribution. Now, the next category to look for is the richest uh, developing countries. So these are the so-called middle-income countries like Mexico, Argentina, uh, India. And if we look at this category, the median... Um, regime lasts uh, uh, 12.5 years, so a little more than 50% larger. Uh, whereas if we Still look not at, so long. Not so long at all. <laughs> not it's, the lifetime of a, uh, of a house or a, a right. land. Just serious. Less than a generation. <laughs> yeah. So this means that most people in the world, so we're talking about 90% of the countries here, uh, experience violent regime change in their lifetime. 90% of the world, in fact. Well, 90% of the world's countries, but... Yes. But if you start with China, yeah. China's had uh, one regime change since World War II, correct? I think so. Mao's revolution. Yes. So a billion people have lived in a very stable system by this definition. Of, as you point out, it's, just, it's an extreme definition. Yes. A lot of change in China. A lot of change period, in but China. Not no regime doubt. change. Yes. Not violence. Uh, not violent turnover. Certainly correct. Cultural, violence. Vo- yeah, violence of See, all this, kinds. This again gets to the point about how it's underestimating violence For because sure. the cultural revolution, you can kill off 10 million people, and uh, that's not counted here. Correct. Although that was certainly a deterrent toward um, long-term planning for many of the I people who lived through it. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> that has the same effect yep. of lowering time horizons and reducing the incentives to invest. Yep. So the final piece of data is looking at the median of the rich countries, that is the top 10% of the income distribution. Uh, and here the median is just dramatically different. The median country... Uh, and these are, these are U.S. England, France, yes. Japan. Netherlands, Denmark, yep. Austria, okay. uh, Sweden, the Nordic countries, of course. So, so uh, 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 the median here is 60 years. So it's just dramatically different. So this is not a continuous yeah. distribution in income. You know, it's positive. You have more income. It goes up for most countries in the developing world, but very flat, and then it jumps. So in other words, there's some missing middle, in a sense. There's some very big difference. There's a big dividing line between um, developed countries on the one hand and developing on the other. I have to say, Barry, uh, we're, we're 12 minutes or so into this podcast. We could probably go home. I mean, but that's, I know you have a lot more to say, but that's an extraordinary thing that I've never thought of, heard. Um, to th- you know, one way to think about it is if you can, s- stability is fabulous, unless it goes <laughs> the other way, yeah. unless causation runs the other way. But there's, right, it could be that, that, um, uh, Rich countries are stable, but not just stable countries are rich. But it's it's a fascinating empirical regularity mm-hmm. there. Yeah, and Danny Roderick actually has, in a 99 paper called, I believe, what, Where Did All the Growth Go?, actually has quite a bit of uh, empirical work on this. He suggests that you know, countries, uh, uh, poor countries do grow, and they actually grow quite fast when they grow, but then they hit various kinds of shocks, and they contract often very quickly. Uh, in 2000 or 2001, Argentina, you may recall, had, had experienced a fair period of economic growth and then overnight devalued. Uh, they, they, they'd pegged their economy to the dollar, so they, devo- they, they suddenly uh, uh, unexpectedly devalued by a half, and the wealth of Argentina fell mostly by, you know, by a half. So uh, that's quite common that there's these uh, various kinds of growth shocks. So... What's the explanation for this level of violence in, or excuse me, what's the implication of this level of violence among poor countries? Well, I'm glad you asked. That's the key question, I think. And that's where we get to uh, the question, uh, again, of economists missing the margin of violence. Because violence is so prevalent, it means that uh, countries have to organize themselves to reduce the probability of violence because it's so awful. Uh, and so this, these figures that I've given you are, uh, uh, in, in a sense, better than they actually look because these countries are organized to reduce the probability of violence. 
So the key implication is that all states have to reduce the, the probability of violence. And one of the problems with that is that there's a dis there, there tends to be in these countries dispor dispersed sources of violence. Uh, that is, means multiple people have uh, uh, access to violence, and so there's no state that has the monopoly on violence that we tend to think about in our developed world. That's a characteristic of the developed world, not the developing world. That, that the state is the one who gets to have put people in jail, yes. shoot them yeah. legally, etc. And that <laughs> there's very little organized violence that, that, that can fight the uh, sovereign commands, for example. Uh, so if we think about Mexico, so Mexico is a, a re relatively rich developing country. So it's more sophisticated and more organized and, 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 and to reduce violence. And yet there are multiple sources of violence in Mexico. So besides the government, we have uh, Pemex, the oil company, the uh, state-run oil company. And it has so many workers, the, the so many more than they need, largely because <clears throat> it's a private army. And so if Mexico wanted to reform Pemex uh, into a more efficient organization and one that captured fewer rents and, and provided more benefits for Mexicans uh, uh, in various forms, uh, they'd have to fight this army. Similarly, with their teachers, teachers unions, for example, have shut down states when they don't get what they want. Uh, and, and, uh, and of course, then there are the drug lords, and there's also the fighting Chiapas and the... Uh, indigenous populations. So there's four alternative sources of violence in Mexico, uh, and it's one of the rich and better organized states. In fact, it's had very few coups since, the 19, since 1930. I have to say something about emergence mm -hmm. uh, and, and coordination. You, you spoke somewhat casually when you said states have to find a way to reduce violence or states look to find ways to reduce violence. Obviously, the people in power don't want to be overthrown. They're, right. they're not trying to create institutions that reduce violence in some general sense, they're trying to keep people who don't like them from overthrowing them. That's that's a very, there's nothing, that's a very natural, organic force. Uh, and it's, as you point out, maybe perhaps surprising how bad they are at it, given that mm -hmm. they have a very natural incentive. Mm -hmm. So how does this tie in back to development? So I, I've gotten a little off the track in my own head. We, we, you made the observation that violence is endemic in the developing world, in this de definition you have of regime change. Why is that significant? Is it, is it simply that that reduces the incentive to invest? Is it the violence itself is destructive? Uh, where's the trap? What's the trap here that we're trying to the use trap to explain our fold. opening question? The, the trap is several fold. So first of all, there's the actual direct incentives that the threat of violence has. So that, in, you know, that, that reduces the returns from investments, especially investments across of economic integration across lines that are likely to fight. And so as a consequence, um, there's much less of that integration of the economy, less specialization and exchange, less investment, the classical sources of economic growth. But there's more, more to it than that, and that is, so how, how, if we have these multiple factions or multiple sources of dispersed violence, how does the state mitigate their fighting, prevent them from fighting? And the way that it does that, it, I, uh, I argue, is that it... Um, creates rents. So this is rent creation. What creates rents? Oh, the state creates rents. Okay. Those in power, as you said, those in power want to remain in power. How do they do it? In the, in, the, in, in the face of multiple sources of violence. And by rents you mean goodies. You don't mean landlords. You mean they no, create uh, profits and, and profit opportunities that are excessive relative to what they otherwise would be. Exactly. They create monopolies, for example. They allow uh, certain groups to have complete control and, in effect, run certain regions, for example, uh, as they see fit, and they run it in an extortionary way. Uh, there's, you know, prevalence of monopolies. Uh, there's there's uh, uh, limits on the degree of competition. There are tariffs, all kinds of different instruments that countries use um, to manipulate the market for political ends, uh, uh, and in this case, to push rents toward those who are powerful in a way that those who are powerful are, more, are better off cooperating with the regime uh, and, and, and consuming their rents instead of fighting. Uh, and they can so it's do a payoff. This. It's so it's a real a payoff. payoff, yes. It's a bribe to, to keep uh, certain groups uh, incentivized to keep the status quo. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And one of the key results uh, in, in the paper, we have a bargaining framework that I, I, I won't won't get into, but the key result, I think, 
we call the uh, uh, proportionality principle, the principle of proportionality. That is, it's the idea that rents have to be in proportion to the power of the different groups. And the reason is, is the more powerful you are, the greater the returns from fighting. And so if we need to incentive, give you incentives not to fight, we have to give you, if you're more powerful, we need to give you more rents. So this also means that if you have little power, a little access to, you know, very little access to organization and violence, you get cut out. Yeah. <laughs> so Bates's story, for example, about the African peasants. The peasants are in the countryside. They're not easily organized. Uh, they've got to attend their crops. And so as a consequence, uh, they're the ones in the regime that are exploited uh, by the rest. So in this story, the problem of violence isn't, it's not so much the direct effects of, uh, that violence destroys mm -hmm. um, resources, which it does. It's purely mm -hmm. wasteful in, the, mm -hmm. in some dimension. And it's not the incentives. It's that the way you best cope with violence is you mess up your economic system, is exactly. what you're saying. Yeah. Exactly. See, and economists have a tendency to look at this and see, with, without recognizing the margin of violence, they look at this and they see what they call market intervention. And the observation is clearly correct. That is, that the, the politics is manipulating the economy for political reasons. And so they're preventing the economy from be, being this great engine of growth. Uh, and economists, uh, in the standard kind of uh, recommendation for reform, they say, well, undo those constraints. And they think that this will make everybody better off. Because the pie is going to get bigger, because you're going to have all this expansion of trade and yeah. investment. But the problem is, is again, as I've mentioned, they've missed the, the, the margin of violence. And so if rents are the glue that's keeping the peace, then undoing these rents undoes the glue. It's insanity. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and so even people that are exploited are willing to support the status quo because being exploited under peace is better than... Uh, being in the middle of uh, a great disorder. So, what I think, I don't know who's, I don't know this literature very well, but it, the, the standard way I used to think about this, and it's it's probably in a, we probably talked about it in a conversation with Bruce Planet of Mosquito a long time ago, but, you know, I tend to think of, well, if you just follow better economic policies, the pie would get bigger, but it's hard to redistribute that larger pie in proportion to what people currently are getting. Mm -hmm. So even though the average mm -hmm. person is going to be better off, you can't necessarily compensate, mm -hmm. you know, as economists often like to pretend they can. Mm -hmm. they, when they talk about efficiency, they, you know, they say, well, we can make everybody better off. Mm -hmm. No one will be worse off. We could after this change. But, of course, there is no cheap transaction-free, cost-free mechanism for right. redistribution. Right. And so that's what keeps things from happening that would be enlarging the pie, but you're making a, a more dramatic argument. You're suggesting that it's not just, well, it's hard to redistribute the the goodies. It's that if you make the pie larger that way, some people are going to get really mad and they're going to kill you. Yes. <laughs> and you're going to get no goodies. You're going to be That's dead. That's exactly or right. There's a real gonna... existential threat here, Yeah. You know, which again, economists tend to ignore. The idea that people might come kill you. You know, because you're 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 the, the masters of the status quo. It's been an oppressive system, uh, and so that 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 is a really important block to uh, the whole problem of reform. So this, in essence, is the violence trap. The idea that um, uh, the way out of the violence trap is through economic integration and reform, but you can't reform if there's a threat of violence, and so you're in something of a trap. Uh, Adam Smith said something like this, uh, not referring to violence, but he said, till some stock is produced, there's no division of labor. But without the division of labor, there can be no stock. So stock is his notion for capital. And so he's clearly seeing a threat there, uh, uh, the kind of trap that, that we're talking about. I think can we talk about that for a sec? Sure. Say, talk about, say that again. Read, because... I if you don't know that stock is capital, the first time you hear it, you're confused because you're going to think about the stock market. So read the quote again, which is a, a great quote about the challenge of igniting prosperity, right? It, yeah. it says you're stock. So remember, Adam Smith opens the wealth of nations with the idea of the uh, 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 division of labor. That the division of labor is the source of specialization exchange and how people get rich. 
Uh, and so that's the key, one of his key features, uh, ideas about economic growth. He has others, but that's a key. So that's one. And the other one is that stock is his word for, as you mentioned, his word for capital. And so here's the quote, or the essence of his idea. Till some stock is produced, there can be no division of labor. But without the division of labor, there can be no stock that gets produced. Right. And, and so you're in a trap. And that, that's the essence of these kind you of... You need surplus. You mm -hmm. need something... To put something aside for the future, which is what a machine or an investment is essentially, it's a, it's a sacrificing consumption day for consumption tomorrow. But if yes. you don't have the division of labor, you're at a subsistence yeah. level, so you can't, can't get started. Yeah. And Thucydides actually put this uh, a little differently, and I'm summarizing here one of my colleagues, Josh Ober, who is one of the experts on Thucydides so in, we in classics. Last summer, yeah. mm -hmm. And he says, uh, uh, he, he summarizes Thucydides as this way. To survive, uh, a community needs a wall. This is in the ancient times. It's very a lot of violence. But why? But but walls require money, capital. How do you yeah. get it? Uh, and in his view, there's two ways of getting it. Uh, uh, you go somewhere, and either you trade or plunder. But to trade or plunder, you need ships. <laughs> How do you get ships? Well, you need to build them. Uh, and in order to build them, you need security <laughs> and a wall. Uh, both, yeah. So without walls. <laughs> And so, so you're stuck. this is the essence of the, the violence trap. You're stuck. Now, why is it that some nations have escaped it? Well, that's a really important question. And, and I think that um, the key to, you know, this is what we call the escaping the violence trap. And, and, and part of this, I think, has to do with uh, greater economic integration. So, so if you have greater in economic integration, you're raising the cost of fighting. Uh, uh, and but but of course violence the threat of violence is what prevents that and so how do you what are the circumstances so one of the things I want to point out is that economic development is relatively rare you can get countries can get rich within being a developing country so uh, Rwanda is much worse off than is Mexico uh, India uh, Venezuela for example but 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 still there's this as, as we suggested there's this big gulf between the richest developing countries and the rich countries um, and so how, do you, how, how does this happen? Well, something in the, in the environment has to change in a way, otherwise you're just in this equilibrium. And that's where the role of shocks come in of various kinds. The world changes. So let me give you an example. So France, between um, the revolution and uh, the 1870s, had something like 11 or 12 constitutions. So it was constantly in turmoil. They were fighting. There were two factions in the post-Napoleonic world. Uh, one and each trying to get an advantage. They were nominally thought of as the Republicans as one and the mar monarchists as another. Um, and they're fighting each other, and uh, it's not a stable place. Uh, and then something happens in 1870 and 71. The Germans. The Germans were not thought of uh, as the great threat in this world, but 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 France and Germany get into a war, the Franco-Prussian War, and uh, uh, the Prussians just beat them handily. And moreover, at the same time, Germany unites. So Prussia becomes much more powerful. They institute um, universal male enfranchisement for the lower house uh, as, as part of their deal. And they begin... Germany? Germany, yes. And they begin conscripting mass armies. So the threat's getting much bigger. And They've so, lost a war and... It looks, the future doesn't look good either. Right. And so the only hope is to cooperate. So survival requires that the two factions stop fighting each other. And of course, the stakes in which they're fighting are small relative to the existential threat of Germany. And of course, we know Germany invades two more times. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and beat, you know, and, 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 and uh, creates problems for France. But there's no regime change in France for a long time. No, in fact, the longest live, so France has had many constitutions since then, and to this day, the longest live constitution is the one they create in 1871 through the middle of the 70s, the Third Republic. Uh, and it lasted all the way to the uh, Nazi capture, takeover in Bichy. 1940. Yeah. Uh, and so this regime uh, uh, is, it's, you know, uh, was, was the most stable of all the French. But the, that's a type of violence we only been in discussing implicitly, which is external violence, right? Yes. To quell internal violence. So you're giving an example of how a country that faces internal 
the potential of internal violence could give that up, could, get a, could escape that trap from, because of the threat of external violence? Well, I think part of the idea is the external threat serves as a commitment device. So one of the problems with the two different sides when they're fighting, I, I didn't mention this in the theoretical discussion, but one of the problems is that shocks regularly change the um, relative capabilities of the, say, say, of the bargaining parties. And remember, we have the proportionality principle, the idea of uh, that stronger uh, people with stronger violence potential have to receive greater, greater rents. So if there are shocks that occur that change their relative capabilities, then you need to adjust the flow of rents. Now, if you and I are potential um, uh, 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 groups that might fight, uh, and I know that your capabilities have risen and mine have diminished, then we can bargain. I, I might not do it happily, but I know I have to because if I don't, you, you're going to fight me. My crush you, yeah. Now, there are two problems with that, with those kind of bargains. One is, is the idea of asymmetric information. Uh, that is, you may become stronger in ways that you know much more about than I do. Correct. So I know you become stronger, but I don't think you become that strong. And you might not know that my particular strengths are ones that are particularly dangerous to you, or yes. vice versa, or they're un relatively undangerous, yeah. yeah. And so as a consequence, if, if you're, you think you're much stronger than I think you are, then the highest bargain I'm willing to give you is lower than the lowest bargain you're willing to accept. Right. In which case we have to fight. Right. So that's a standard model Jim Fearon and, uh, and others have had about fighting, international fighting. Because on the surface, fighting is stupid. Yes. Uh, excuse Could me, not, not, th 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 those models are in the, the, the world of international fighting, and I'm using it here within factions within right. a country, same principle. Uh, and so the way that the international threat, so now we add to this mix international violence. And so the way the international violence works is it changes the incentives of the parties. Because the amount I want to take from you is small relative to the amount that the outsider is going to take from both, both of us. Yeah. Uh, and so as a consequence, we start to cooperate. We see this quite regularly in the world. Which is fabulous, because mm -hmm. intellectually fabulous, because mm -hmm. it's hard to understand why people suddenly can get along. But it's, you're saying there's an incentive often. Yes, an incentive, yes. So former enemies become... Uh, fast friends, and so I think this is an example, and it's uh, and the number of countries that have this kind of existential threat uh, in the modern world are relatively small. So Korea and Taiwan are, are examples, uh, but so many other countries don't have this kind of existential threat. Uh, this gets us to the work of Bob Bates, uh, kind of moving far afield, but one of the things Bates argues in his 2000 work, 2001 book on violence and prosperity uh, is that uh, the, the developed world polices the borders of the um, developing countries. And as a consequence, uh, it's very hard for them to face these existential threats. Uh, and so, uh, uh, as a consequence, this mechanism of the outside threat is, is not very prevalent in the modern world. I'll go back to Korea and Taiwan. You're mm -hmm. suggesting that the threat of Chinese aggression. North Korean and Chinese aggression, yes. Makes South Korea and Taiwan more uh, prone to mm -hmm. cooperate with internally. Their mm -hmm. factions are, are less uh, mm -hmm. prone to violence, and then you can get good economic policies. You're suggesting that the growth rates of the rather extraordinary economic performance of South Korea and Taiwan are politically possible <laughs> because they uh, are worried about an external threat. How do you then explain China's growth rate and China's liberalization. How, how did they... Well, I'm not saying this is a necessary condition. I mean, China, I think, is extraordinary. I do think that they, that they did perceive uh, an existential threat, given that they were an aggressive communist nation in the uh, uh, mid-70s at the death of Mao, and that they did um, worry about how they would um, survive. And so if you look at the initial history of reform, um, Deng Xiaoping is the master of reform, but he's not the initial leader. Instead, there's a more a modestly liberal, more liberal uh, leader than, than, than Mao. And um, uh, everyone knows after the Cultural Revolution that had just ended uh, that uh, you needed more economic growth in order to get back on the road toward prosperity and survival. And the modestly liberal uh, leader was unable to create this, and so uh, he was removed and Deng Xiaoping came to power. And remember, Deng Xiaoping didn't set out to, for gross reform. 
Um, he did it very incrementally, and he really believed in the Pareto principle, in the literal Pareto principle. Which is? Which is the idea, it's not that in principle we can make everybody better off. And no one worse but off. But every step has to make people better off without creating big losers. So the first thing that he did was reform uh, uh, agriculture from the collectivization uh, the, and, and, and that very failed model of production uh, uh, in the countryside. Fled to famine and millions of deaths. Yes. Uh, uh, he uh, created reform so that people had long-term leases uh, and private and with along with privatization and agriculture production of grain doubled in two or three years yeah. and for the first time the countryside was able to feed itself because under the Mao as you said uh, there were there were famines uh, the Mao uh, system was exploiting them they were hard to organize so Mao system exploited them by underfeeding them uh, expropriating so, their grain Right, mm -hmm. yeah. And so this system provided much more grain for everybody, including the farmers. So right away, you've got, now you've got 400 million people who are, who are supporting happy. the next yeah. step. <laughs> yeah, sure. You know, and so the next step was, you know, Guangdong, one step ahead. And it was done in a way that if it failed, it wouldn't have been uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping's problem. Why? Why? Because it, they're letting it... Uh, that what they did was they, uh, uh, it was called One Step Ahead, the reform process. And they let um, Guangdong reform as an experiment. And if it failed, Guangdong, Guangdong would have been the failure. I mean, it would have had some negative implications for Deng, but it wouldn't have been like he created national reform that failed on a national level. Uh, and, and, and he didn't choose a random place. He chose the place that was most likely to succeed Guangdong being the old, uh, with the old Shanghai, being the trading, one of the trading uh, entrepots of China in, in the years before Mao. And so they, they had the most ties to capital, uh, Chinese capital around the world from people who had fled. Uh, and in, as we know, the rest is history. You know, it's, the, the experiment succeeded and was imitated. Yeah, internally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what about the peace trap, um, the good kind of trap? One has the impression, which I think is overrated, but most Americans, I think, believe that there is no chance of anything changing in the United States, of almost any kind. They can't imagine um, – well, lately they're starting to imagine it, but, but in general, that, that, that something would fundamentally change in the U.S. It seems extremely stable. The odds of a violent coup, the odds of the military, say, overthrowing the government, the odds of – the mafia overthrowing the government, mm -hmm. um, minimal. So not just minimal, unimaginable in the literal sense mm -hmm. of the word. People can't imagine. I can. I can imagine it. Mm -hmm. I, I, as you pointed out, in world history, these things happen, mm -hmm. but they happen infrequently, mm -hmm. as you point out, it, in the in the wealthy countries. Mm -hmm. Are we all set? Could we fall back into a a violence trap, or are we going to cruise along? No, I, I, I agree with you. I think that there is a possibility of falling back. I don't think it's very likely, but it's not zero. I mean, excuse me. And one example, for example, <laughs> one example is, uh, suppose 9-11 uh, had been the first of many. Right. So one of the things we know, if you look at opinion polls uh, after 9-11, is that uh, a majority in the country favored trading off rights for security. So suppose there had been one every six months, for, you know, just on average, for 10 years. The world would have been so much different than, it, than, than the world. Uh, our world would have been so much different, and there would have been a significant reaction on the part of the uh, government, likely, to create more security, a significant demand from the people to create more security, uh, even at the expense of rights. And we could see a very different United States because the margin of violence had suddenly changed. But let's keep let's keep on that story for a minute. So, mm -hmm. and I, I, I you know I qualify what I said a minute ago because we're at a time now where people are very um, they're concerned about the NSA um, surveillance. They're concerned about the political use of the IRS. We don't really know what the full story is there. Uh, so there is, I think, a little slightly heightened awareness of the potential for the abuse of power mm -hmm. at the at the national level, especially mm -hmm. when it's classified. Where mm -hmm. we, you know we, we can we can imagine the worst. Um, if there had been a series of violent acts from the outside, so there might have been some removal of 
of individual rights. Mm -hmm. There might have been uh, more surveillance, more uh, mo camera monitoring, more preventive arrests even mm -hmm. than, than we have now under mm -hmm. our current system. And if you saw it yesterday, I, th I think it's a true story. Somebody had been Googling backpacks and Googling crockpots. And that reminded the employer of this person that of the Boston Marathon bombing. And so a team of scary people showed up at this guy's house to know why he'd been Googling backpacks and crockpots. Um, the pressure cookers, excuse me, right. not crock. I think you're safe with crockpots, listeners. Uh, but it's pressure cookers, maybe yes. that's what the dangerous search term is. But anyway, that would have, let's say that happened. I'd have been upset, disappointed, perhaps. I hope I'd have been one of the people who would have said this is a bad trade off, but maybe not. Maybe I'd have gone along and said it's necessary to preserve uh, our security, reduce the odds of these horrific attacks, as, as we were imagining that they were frequent. Um, would that change the odds? of a regime change? If, if we lost some rights, First Amendment rights, search and seizure rights as citizens, are you suggesting that we could move to a world where we wouldn't have civil, peaceful elections and transfer power between Republicans and Democrats? Um, what I, story do you have in mind there? I, I, it's a fascinating I, thing to think about. I don't think that's very likely, but I think it's possible. And I think that the reason is is that in the drive to create more security, uh, people would willingly support compromises in not only rights but the rules of the game. And so Congress, for example, is a, could be seen as a problem by the executive branch because there are so many leaks. Uh, and it's in the way they have uh, you know, all kinds of uh, uh, special interests that they're trying to protect in the ways that security goes. I can talk at great length about the Homeland Security Act and all the politics there and the way in which security, the provision of Homeland Security was greatly compromised by the nature of the political exchanges. Uh, and I think we'd see a lot more of that uh, if there was more legislation needed. And as a consequence, you can imagine that the executive branch reacts to this by trying to say they're, they're an impediment to solving our problem. And remember, if there's lots of violence that's going on from, from these terrorists, uh, a large number of people, I think, would, would, would support this. As I mentioned, with the, um, uh, with the opinion polls after just one event that, that a majority of the country, I think, then felt uh, that it was okay, you know, that these compromises were okay. I don't think a majority now feels, but we've had 12 years of relative peace, relative absence of these terrorists. Whereas if we had one every six months, I think people would feel much more insecure. And I guess to play along with your um, unpleasant thought experiment, um, in many ways, I think there are a lot of people who are violently, who are violently um, opinionated about either of these very discrete binary choices, mm -hmm. right? Either think we need a lot more security mm -hmm. or a lot less. Mm -hmm. And I could see violence erupting between those two groups. I could see mm -hmm. um, if it got serious enough, yeah. right? And, we, and people felt the country was losing its character either because it was insecure or too secure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's um, another form of our polarized society. Yeah, a, a different, very different one than we usually talk about or worry about. But, um, you know, mm -hmm. if you, if you, you follow Twitter. Polarize along those same lines. Not, what? not, not. It, it, the polarization could be along very similar lines, not not exactly the same as Democrats versus Republicans. No, but it, it it's um, it, it's hard to remember. But in seventeen seventy six, there were a lot of people who didn't want to go to war, and a lot of people who did, mm -hmm. and uh, that's that can lead to internal violence. Mm -hmm. it, it, I'm sure, there was some. <laughs> Well, one thing to remember there, which we tend to, an ugly episode in our history, is we actually kicked out the loyalists after the, um, after the war, and that's... We kicked them out? Yes, we kicked them out. What did we do to them? Literally <laughs> exported? We ex ex started the ex confiscated export. properties and various kinds of things, and that's where um, English Canada came from. They left, and they, they left from the United States, because, as you recall, uh, Canada was French. Correct. I do recall that. That's good. I didn't know we kicked the loyalists out. Oh, yes. People who were loyal to the British yeah, crown. Right. Yes. The last thing I'll say about this, then we're going to turn to Smith, is that I, I do find it interesting in the aftermath of 9-11, in some dimension, how little 
we move towards security. Mm -hmm. If we think about past episodes of U.S. history, mm -hmm. uh, most obvious being the um, the Japanese treatment of the Japanese at, in World War during World War II, or the Germans, right. uh, German Americans, or Japan, particularly Japanese Americans, it, that is unimaginable today. Um, mm -hmm. we, we we reacted to the 9/11. Um, I, I really don't like that we make people take their shoes off and X-ray them, but in the grand scheme of things, it's it's strikingly small, yeah. and I think your point's correct that if it were every six months, maybe it wouldn't be so small, we'd be on a different path. Yeah. Let's turn to Adam Smith. What does Smith have to say about this that's uh, that might be relevant? Well, Smith, one of the exciting things I find in reading uh, Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations is book three. And book three, I think, is historically been the least interesting book for economists. Uh, in part because, uh, let me put it this way, um, you can read Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations, uh, and, and Blaug in, Etrus, in, in Economic Theory in Retrospect says this explicitly. Mark, this is Mark Blaug. Mark Blaug, yes. That uh, 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 the Wealth of Nations is uh, a treatise on economic development. And one of the confusing things I think about Smith is, uh, is that he offers three different ideas about economic development. So I mentioned one, the division of labor. You want greater development, you've got to create the conditions that foster economic development. Uh, uh, specialization. Specialization, yeah. exchange, division of labor. Second, uh, he emphasized, in, and, and that's books one and two. And I should say, he explicitly laid out the most important one, which is the size of the market, right? He yes. said you've you got to have trade over large... Groups. Yep. yep. Larger the market, the greater the division of labor. That yep. famous phrase. Uh, in book five, he's very explicit about the nature of, uh, book four rather, he's very explicit about the nature of policies. That if you have bad pol economic policies, um, you lead bad growth. And here's where he talks about all kinds of the guild regulation, Protection monopolies, and of course, uh, constraints on international trade, and hence international specialization and exchange. So economists very, both, both those speak very clearly to modern economics. Uh, the, the, the problem is, is that in book three, uh, he has another, another set of ideas about the political foundations about uh, economic growth. And the problem for economists in seeing it is that it's, it's, it's written differently. This is, this, this is an odd part of the book in a way. It's the shortest uh, piece of the book. Uh, it's only 50 pages. The Wealth of Nations is a thousand pages. So this is 5%. All the other books are in hundreds of pages. And one of the problems is it's a narrative. So it's hard to pick out what are the key underlying abstract points. The rest of the book is, uh, book one and two is abstract theory, book, five, book four very is... And very analytical. Yes, and, and, and book, books four and five are applications in just the way economists do that now. Book five is a narrative. So what is book, uh, book three? So what does book three say? Well, first of all, he begins with a story about uh, why feudalism uh, uh, was in equilibrium. Why it was. Yes. That why is why it was stable for so long. Uh, and by the way, I didn't remember reading book three. I maybe had not before this podcast that you're urging. Uh, it's an encouragement. I read it. And it's, uh, it's a very brief history of the world. Yes. <laughs> right? He starts, I think, with... Primitive ancient times before the building of cities. Then he goes to Rome, and then he goes to Middle Ages, and then he gets the the present. But it's a it's a very uh, quick sweeping, overview. Yes. Sweeping is the right word. Yes. And you're right; it's very different. Yes. And so what he does, he does two things, really big things, I think, in this. In, in this, he concentrates on uh, feudalism as an equilibrium, and then what are the processes by which that changed? How did we get the transition to what he called the the uh, commercial economy? Uh, what we think of as a process of development, a much richer w world where there was rule of law, there's investment contracts, uh, competitive markets, uh, and, and of course uh, uh, political and civil rights as well. And so he explains this. And so, um, uh, and I think the violence trap is very useful in understanding what Smith says, because I think Smith's argument about the stability of the Middle Ages is very much a violence trap argument. And so one of the things he's saying is that there's uh, fighting among the local lords all the time, uh, that the king is uh, a little bit uh, stronger than the local lords, but not strong enough to impose security. So there's no law in this system. Uh, 
got and, islands of security, but that threaten to fight among themselves. Yes, and because they're fighting each other all the time, uh, there's uh, uh, what he calls this constant predation. Uh, one of the things he says is that men in this defenseless state naturally content themselves with their necessary subsistence because to acquire more might only tempt the injustice of their oppressors. Yeah. So in other words, there's very little investment in this, very little specialization in exchange. The vast majority of the population, probably on the order of 99%, is living at subsistence. Uh, and then there's a small elite, military elite, that lives on top of this that extracts from the peasants, and they fight each other all the time. And this reflects the whole idea of the violence trap and the idea of, so you and I are neighbor, neighboring lords, and we have an accommodation. Uh, and, and I've been a little stronger than you are, and so I've been able to take some things from you and for, or force you to give me things, that is, land and peasants. And uh, the threat of violence. And the threat of violence. Because I'm more powerful. Yeah. It's and, kind of you very in, our, in your example to let me be the more powerful one. Go, go ahead. Instead of you, you could have said you're the... Well, I was going to... I actually wanted to do it the other way, but okay, so you're the more powerful one. But what well, happens? That's what you did, yeah. But you, what, what happens? You don't have a son, and I have sons. And so while you're more powerful now, uh, 20 years from now, uh, you, you don't have a son, and you don't have a way of organizing. You're too old to do this. And as a consequence, I come back and I, we fight again, and you've got to give up things for me. And this is happening constantly. Because we've got these shocks, essentially. That are yes. The shocks are prevalent all the time in various kinds of forms. Um, so one way to think about this is that there's, this is a world of, uh, uh, a world in which uh, there are three players. So I've mentioned the king. Uh, the king is not particularly more powerful than the lord a little bit, uh, th and there are many other lords. So in aggregate, they're much stronger than he is. Uh, but there are also a third group, and that's the towns. And the towns are traders, and they're located on the coast. And there's uh, a, one of the things that occurs uh, around the 9th and the 10th century is, uh, is an expansion of trade. Uh, so there are greater possibilities of economic expansion, but the problem is, is that the, the elite, uh, the lords are predating on the towns. And so as a consequence, they, they are unable to take advantage of this. Now, when you say they're predating, they're being predatory, what, what, what's the... Is this is this fifty two hundred and fifty guys on a horse on horseback, burning down parts of the town and, and going to the corn silo and what are they doing there? Do we know? Yeah, they're doing and, and exactly. How do we know, that. by the way? There's there aren't a lot of they didn't have they didn't have YouTube back uh -huh. in the ninth and tenth century, so we don't have any we don't have any videos of this. Seriously, how how do we know anything about there are records, what happened? And there are there are people that have written about this and tell you know so there's 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 plenty of work. You know, both of archaeologists and anthropologists, as well as historians, and there's plenty of records. There's that not survive. a lot. Of, not a lot of primary sources. So no, there's not data. Time. We don't see that yeah. kind of thing. So we don't see the uh, of that. But nonetheless, what we do see is, um, you know, uh, these records of these violence, these predations on the part of the local lords who hate these guys because they're trying to amass um, uh, mass uh, an alternative source of wealth and power, and possibly. Uh, 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 fight them, and so as a consequence, they're constantly predating and fighting these, these guys. And so in this world, um, uh, uh, there's, in the, there, uh, so a political exchange emerges in this world between the kings and the town uh, against the middle. So both, are, are, both have problems with the, uh, uh, with the lords, and as a consequence, they form this alliance, uh, which you can think of as tax limitation <laughs> agreement. Uh, so what the towns do is they agree to a fixed uh, payment every year uh, of taxes to the, to, to the king uh, and uh, also are willing to give some military service to the king. In exchange, they get the right Which to... Which helps him tremendously because he, he needs to... He's outnumbered by the Lord's right. effective armies. He's got nothing to really... He has no leverage, little leverage. Now he has more. Now he has more leverage. Uh, in exchange, they get the uh, the towns get the ability to build walls, to self-govern, and also to trade, uh, as well as defend themselves. So they begin to create local armies, and they have a military advantage locally over the local lords. This is key. Uh, and the reason they do that is that they're more organized. They're right together, and they can say, okay, well, I'll go. So if they start moving into the countryside... The problem is, is the way the military organizations uh, of each of the lords work is it's very dispersed. Each of their 
uh, the underlords. Uh, they don't have a barracks. Uh, yeah, they don't have a barracks, right? <laughs> you know, they're all separate. S scared around. And so when a threat comes like this, they have to get organized. That takes time. That doesn't happen overnight. And so the town's able to sub subdue the local lords. And this has an important economic consequence because... This is very wine guest talking, not Adam Smith. Uh, Adam You're using the Smithian insight that, that there was tension and threat of violence. But this 9th, 10th century history and the organization of lords with the king, that's, that's not in book three, or is it? Well, some of this is. I, okay. You are right that I'm missing, mixing my own interpretation of this. Carry on. But, but Smith does explain how uh, the local lords are subdued. Okay, go ahead. Um, he doesn't explicitly you, say, talk about the military advantage. That was a piece I added. But he does talk about them subduing and about the consequence is, is that they bring their rules into the countryside that they've subdued. And that transforms what had been very poor, self-sufficient agriculture with very little division of labor into an exchange economy where they start producing food and other kinds of uh, 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 primary products that can be exported. And so they become market participants, specialists in market participants uh, that are often international markets. And so we're getting the advantage of the expansion of the market and the division of labor. And it's because the towns are able to impose their system of rules and liberty and rule of law on the countryside. And another thing that Smith explains that happens is that uh, very rich merchants start to move into the town, in, into the countryside, and organize. They start to experiment with agriculture, invest and innovate, and bring their, 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 their capital. And so we see growth in the countryside that feeds this. But that makes the town more str even stronger and so uh, it, it expands its international trade, gets more profits from there. It expands the size of the market locally. It becomes more powerful, and it expands locally. And it does it again. So part of what they're doing is subduing the local lords who no longer... And, and, and one of the things he mentions that, that Smith emphasizes is there's a dramatic sociological change in the countryside because these local lords who used to be military leaders now have been subdued. Uh, they no longer have uh, military organizations. They no, no longer need to support, spend their rents on supporting the, all these retainers that were part of the military organization. So they get rid of those guys. And, and they, they have to go do something productive instead of merely yeah. beating people up or fighting off the other lords. And part of what happens is this, the, the middle level, the middle ranks um, start to become uh, 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 investors in agriculture and uh, we see their property rights uh, go up, uh, their rights go up, and they become greater producers, and they become, their output. in some places, the gentry. Uh -huh. And so over a century or so, we see a dramatic change in the countryside. And so what we see here is the escape from the violence trap. There's something that's very novel that comes along. So the, the forcing variable, the exogenous change there, is this increase in trade that allows the seaside port city to get a little richer mm -hmm. and if it can do that before mm -hmm. it gets expropriated mm -hmm. they, they have a chance to mm -hmm. use that incentive to organize and then keep, keep the, uh, the yeah. lords at bay. Yeah. And so we can sort of look at the history of Europe in this way in the following sense. Let's do some comparative statics. So one of the things that's occurring is the king is getting stronger as a consequence of this alliance. The, the lords are getting weaker. Uh, and so there's something of a clash between the kings and the, um, uh, and the towns eventually. And, and it goes different ways. So let's start with um, France. So France is do predominantly interior countries. And, uh, uh, interior? Meaning that there's, uh, most people live away from the coast. Okay. And so the reach of the coastal towns is relatively small into the interior of France. Uh, so as a consequence, uh, the towns don't become particularly powerful in France. Uh, and, and so the effect of the towns on the countryside is small. Nonetheless, because France is so big, it's, it, 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 it's nonetheless powerful as, uh, uh, as, uh, as a, a nation against the world. Um, the Dutch Republic is just the opposite. It starts almost exclusively with towns, and the, the local population, uh, agriculture population, is easily uh, uh, taken over by the towns, and it becomes almost 100% market.
Uh, and so it is dominated by the towns and, and has rule of law. It's a republic, the Dutch Republic, for example. And grows tremendously. And grows tremendously and becomes this tiny little place, becomes one of the richest places in the world in the 17th century. And in fact, uh, in the Dutch revolt against the Spanish, the, the Habsburgs had uh, uh, nominal control over the uh, uh, Dutch in the, the 16th century. Uh, and the Habsburgs try and extract too much taxes in the Dutch revolt. And nobody expects the, this tiny little province, set of provinces, to, to, to be the most powerful organization in the world. But they do. And part of the reason they do is because they have a market economy, they have rules, and they're able to, there's so much capital there that they're able to use debt financing to finance a much larger war than the Spanish <laughs> expect. Uh -huh. cool. So that's the difference. Uh, now let's look at England. England is roughly divided um, in the 17th century between half and half. So there are a lot of coastal towns. London is one of the great trading uh, uh, places in the world. As the, and London needs from, uh, London as a town needs two things, food and firewood. Yeah. And as it grows, it needs more food and firewood. How do, so what happens? So all up and down the Thames River Valley and the coastal towns up and down the, uh, uh, around the mouth of the Thames become uh, transformed from this self-sufficient agriculture, poor self-sufficient agriculture into... Um, uh, markets producing in this specialized international economy, supporting London as the trading entrepreneur. Of, producing, say, one one crop instead of trying yeah. to feed yourself with, yeah. Yeah, and they become rich. And they're supporters of the commercial economy, of course, because uh, their fate's tied up with the commercial economy. Whereas the interior of England uh, is, is still remains this traditional uh, subsistence economy. And these are the two groups that fight the Civil War in the 1640s. Uh, and, of course, what's happening is the, the commercial economy is growing, getting more powerful, and ultimately comes after the Glorious Revolution in 1689, comes to take over uh, and dominate in the 18th century and creates this, uh, a really successful commercial economy that then Smith starts writing about in the mid and late 18th century. You said the U.S. had the longest mm -hmm. uh, regime. How long is England? Well, England is kind of hard How are we to count tell. Uh, remember, when I say America has the longest regime, um, we can think about that in two ways. One is the violence way, in which case um, England looks longer. Because they if, go back to 1689, right? Yes. But if we look at constitutional changes... Okay. Uh, in that case, so ask the question about constitutions. Um, then, in that case, the United States is the oldest. The big constitutional changes in, in, the, in the British 19th century uh, dramatically altered the constitution from a small, uh, from a, a political nation of a small elite to a much larger uh, universal male franchise in a series of steps beginning in 1832 uh, and ending in the 1870s. I say anything else about Samantha? I just want to say that having go back and, and read book three at your suggestion, um, it's hard reading. I think I'll be able to understand a lot better having heard your uh, your overview of it and expansion of it. But I would encourage everybody to try to read the first paragraph. It's long. It's hard. It's maybe three quarters of a page, two thirds of a page. Uh, but he says some beautiful things about how trade between the country and this and the city between the town and the farm uh, benefit both, and um, it's quite it's quite beautiful. Mm -hmm. Can I say anything else? <laughs> well, I think it's uh, exciting to see uh, you know Adam Smith uh, in this in this realm that is talking about the political foundations of uh, of markets and of the market economy, and explaining something about both why in the feudal era it. it the market economy was uh, uh, was wholly absent, and why that was stable based on violence, and why this was a you know in a small part of the world this was able to change in a dramatic way over a period of centuries, uh, so that we see the the rise of the commercial economy. Uh, Adam Smith, I think, looking at the larger picture, I think Adam Smith has much more insights uh, about politics uh, and about the organization of politics, the macro-level politics of organizing the economy and the society uh, 
uh, than I think he's given credit for. And I think that uh, we're going to see a lot more analysis in the next decade of this as political scientists pay more attention to this. Before we close, I'd ask you one, come back to the violence trap, which um, we've, we touched on this earlier, but I want to let you finish with that, with, it, with, this, with this point. Uh, there are a lot of people in today's world, billions, who live very poor lives for a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons is the one you pointed out today, which is the uncertainty and um, bad effects of, of the threat of violence and the inability of these nations to get out of these traps. And I asked you why things sometimes change. There's sometimes an external shock, there's mm -hmm. an outside threat, and that causes some internal cooperation, some, often that allows good economic policy to emerge. Uh, we spend a lot of time in the developed world, at least among the elites, talking about how to help poor people. And I would argue that our efforts from the outside to help them inside, has those efforts have been quite ineffective mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of reasons. Is there any policy implication from this analysis of the violence trap that you, know, you talked about outside shocks. Mm -hmm. um, anything you think follows from this that you want to mention? Uh, yes, and here I'll mention an edited volume that I've uh, produced along with uh, Doug North, uh, John Wallace, and Steve Webb, uh, Steve Webb of the World Bank. Uh, uh, Whose title I'm forgetting. That's okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll, uh, but, we'll find a link to it. We'll, we'll find the title after, after this podcast is... Completed. In the shadow of violence. In the shadow of violence. In the shadow of violence, okay. it's called. And we focus uh, on the lessons of this approach uh, for the developing countries. And so let me mention a couple ideas. Uh, one is um, there's a tendency in the world, uh, consider a failed state like Somalia or the Congo now or Rwanda. Um, one of the problems uh, with the United States in rebuild, uh, not the United States, with the aid community is the idea that let's do everything at once. That is, build democracy, rule of law, uh, and uh, uh, good governance, and, and uh, of course, a market economy. Because those are things we associate with prosperity, so if you have all those, you're going to be prosperous. Yes. And the implicit political theory is that you can take these things and transplant them. Move them. <laughs> to these other places. Uh, Iraq is another example, uh, as was Afghanistan. And the problem is, is that this almost never works. That is, transplanting it doesn't work. And from the violence trap, you can see part of the reason this doesn't work because this, they're not in, these these uh, these projects are not involved very much in the uh, solution in solving the problem of violence. So either you leave it dispersed, or you try and get the country to have a monopoly on violence, as we have. But you don't have the controls on the violence, and so if if a country if the leaders of a country gain monopoly control, they use it to predate everybody and organize them into very sad countries. Uh, I think Saddam Hussein was, uh, uh, Iraq was an example of this. And I think we're likely to see that kind of thing reemerge in Iraq, uh, if, if, if not. Right, they're just fighting over who gets to be the next guy who's going to yeah. take advantage of people. Yeah. And so one of the things that, that, that we talk about is that it may well be that you don't want to disarm the population <laughs> in this, and that uh, in the short run, uh, it may be more important to create peace and stability than it is to create democracy, because democracy in these settings tends to be very unstable. My guest today has been Barry Weingast. Barry, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks for having me. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.